This week on Talking Pictures with Neil Rosen, we'll look at The Nest, starring Jude Law and Carrie Coon as a married couple facing some new problems. The new drama, The Artist's Wife, along with my interview with its star, Lena Olin. A call to spy, plus a look at the new documentary, Class Action Park, which looks back at the world's most dangerous water park. We've got all that and many more movie picks coming up. I'm Neil Rose, and welcome to Talking Pictures. It's our monthly critics roundtable show where we debate what's worth watching and what's not when it comes to new releases, hidden gems, and Hollywood classics. Now, we know most of the movie theaters are still closed, and you're probably craving some entertainment. So along with my panel, who are all streaming from home, we have plenty of movies and TV series for you to binge watch. Joining me are Bill McCuddy from Gold Derby. Hi, Bill. Hi, Neil. I'm fine. Why do you ask? Everything's okay. I promise I'm good. Lisa Rossman from Signs and Sirens. Hi, Lisa. Hello, Neil. Thank you, as always, for the opportunity to wear lipstick. Uh, thank you for being here. And joining us this month is Justine Browning, coming back from Entertainment Weekly. Hi, Justine. Hi. So nice to see all of you. It's been way too long. It has been. And let's start out with a look at several new films that are available on demand, beginning with a new film called The Nest. Let's take a look at a clip. This will be our fourth move in 10 Turn years. Backwards. But money's fine, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. This is a fresh start. <laughs> How about this? Oh my God. It's perfect, I know. That's what we always wanted. Is it? Lisa, tell us about The Nest. This is the long-awaited sophomore effort from director Sean Durkin after 2011's super eerie and weirdly named Martha Marcy May Marlene. Uh, this one is set in the 1980s and it stars Jude Law as a flailing ex-commodities broker who moves his two kids and his horse trainer, angry wife, what are you about? played by the tremendous great. Carrie Coon. You may remember her from The Leftovers. Uh, they move to an enormous England country home to try to reboot his prospects. Okay, needless to say, it slides from being kind of a Ralph Lauren chamber piece to a Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf marital psychodrama. And I think at heart, this is kind of an emperor has no clothes think piece that looks at how everyone suffers when the American dream is taken too literally and is misapplied. Uh, the acting is better than the plot, but that's not saying much because the acting is outrageously good and the tension really builds hauntingly. There are some <laughs> brilliant confrontation scenes that I couldn't shake later. And there's a, sc a score by Arcade Fire's Richard P. Perry that's a standout. I really like this film. Bill, what do you think? Uh, I hate to say this, but I agree completely. And uh, for the record, nobody from remembers anyone from The Leftovers. Uh, although she is an outstanding <laughs> actress, everyone is is really good in this, as you said. It might be Jude Law's best in a long time. Oh my God, he's amazing. About, what Lisa said about the score is really interesting because when it goes around the house, you almost think you're in a horror movie. And then you realize at the end, you really have been in a horror movie. I can't recommend this more except for a kind of a, a, an odd little ending that feels indie to me in Tag Tom. But other than that, this is uh, time well spent with people you don't want to spend time with. <laughs> Justine. This really, really stayed with me. I agree with both of you. It's atmospheric. It's anchored by these two engrossing performances from actors who have honed their craft on the stage. And that skill set really shines through here. It's refreshing to see something so bare bones and raw that relies slowly on, solely on flawless acting and directing. And it really pains me, as you said, Lisa, that it's been almost 10 years since Durkin's first film. And I would say just from these two films alone, he's emerging as a master of capturing quiet rage. You know, this is really smart grown-up entertainment, which there's a lack of these days. And um, as you anywhere. mentioned, Durkin's made this fascinating, smart look at a marriage that's really in distress. And I, I think it just might be Jude Law's best performance. You said one of the best. I think it might be his best. And Carrie Coon matches him note for note. And um, there's also a lot of unexpected reveals along the way, mm -hmm. which I think is great. I mean, in the beginning, you think, I'm looking at this like, idyllic family and I don't want to give too much away but there's some you know twists and turns and I think it's good definitely check this out moving on let's talk about the new movie called A Call to Spy Bill well it turns out Neil that in World War II Winston Churchill had a special operations executive branch and they began recruiting amateur spies sadly that means women mostly 
Uh, but the division has just uh, been started, and it must be just down the hall from Kira Knightley and Benedict Cumberbatch from Imitation Game, because this movie feels a little bit like that. We have female spies who are dropped behind the scenes. It was written and directed by a woman. In fact, it was written by the star who's pretty good in this thing. Her name is Sarah Megan Thomas. It also stars uh, Radhika Apti and Stana Kotick, if I'm saying that correctly, the woman from Castle, the ABC show that ran for, for many seasons. Listen, to me, at two hours and four minutes, this thing is a little long and it takes a, almost an hour for it to kick in. But during a pandemic, why not? It's like a book that you don't like at first, but suddenly it gets good. And for that reason, I'm recommending it. Justine? I actually found the pacing to be really well put together. You're thrown right into the story. It sets up a world really quickly. You're swept up in it. It's really engrossing. And of course, there's been an absence of women's narratives when it comes to both world wars and particularly women of color. And you have that here with the story of Noor Inayat Khan, which, as you said, is played by Radhika Abde. I can't help but imagine how the film would have been if it was told from her perspective, because her story is actually so fascinating. And it made me want to learn more about her life and these women in general. At times, the story feels like it's pushing an emotion on you with the score and the editing, but overall, it's really affecting. Lisa? I admit my heart sank when I saw this was yet another World War II drama. Like, amazing that they're still making them. And in fact, I think it is a little subdued. I, you know, how much Bill and I hate agreeing with each other, though we actually do it quite often. But I, I also think the plotting was a little also subdued, maybe. Uh, but the concept of self-sacrifice by those who are not respected or protected by their country is unfortunately very timely right now, and it's well explored here. Well, um, Bill, you, saw, you thought it might have been too long. I thought it was too short. I think that I would have liked to have seen this as a miniseries that would have really explored more the details of each of the characters. I know you're a big James Bond fan, Bill. You might be interested to know that the spy mistress, the one who recruited all the spies, Ian Fleming actually based... Um, the character of uh, of Money Penny, Miss Money Penny, on that particular character. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, considering they had a limited budget for this, I think they did a very good job, and I think it's great. They're always focusing on male spies in movies. I mean, it, it was like these women did did a really great, courageous job. I'm glad that they're getting their time in the limelight and getting um, you know getting their due. Next up is the movie Critical Thinking. Justine. This is the directorial debut from actor John Leguizamo. It's a true story set in 1998 Miami, and it focuses on a dedicated teacher, also played by, by Leguizamo in the film, who inspires a group of Latinx and Black teens from the inner city to become chess champions. It features a phenomenal cast of young talent. It touches on a range of poignant themes and issues. At times it's moving, crushing, and uplifting all at once. And it really captures so beautifully the backdrop that it's portraying. And I think this is becoming my signature quote on the show, but I was a puddle of tears by the end of this when the credits rolled. Um, Bill's holding up a sign. Um, I guess you don't agree, Bill? Well, look, all I'm saying is just because something's true doesn't make it a good story. Uh, John Leguizamo does a good job directing this thing, and I was interested in these people. And at the end, you get to meet the real people. That's kind of cool. But a lot of storylines get dropped in this thing out of nowhere just because they go off to Los Angeles for this, uh, this final chess tournament. And, you know, Leguizamo has said before he made this movie that it's hard to make chess interesting, and I think he proved it with the film. Uh, it's a noble misfire for me. I don't, agree. I, I don't agree with Bill at all. Um, I think this film is knowingly cheesy in all the right ways. Uh, actually, just like John Leguizamo himself, if you think about it. Um, it's that kind of underdog drama that feels like the right thing to watch right now, uh, partly because it builds a sort of can-do-it message, which all underdog dramas have, um, along with an acknowledgement that people of color are so often written out of history. Uh, I thought it was humanizing and inspiring, and I'm not going to pretend it breaks the mold. And I actually agree with Bill that some... There are a few subplots that get cut, that dropped and maybe shouldn't have been introduced in the first place. Um, but I totally disagree with you that it doesn't engage with you on the chess level. Like I was, I paid much more attention to the chess than I normally do with chess movies. And I'm not gonna lie, I choked up more than a couple times in this film. I think this was great. And Justine, who brought this to my attention, I wanna thank you for recommending this or, or, or making us watch it. Um, because before I saw the film, I said, okay, another one of these, it's gonna be, to serve with love by, you know, meets, um, you know, stand and deliver. And you've just seen dozens of these kinds of movies. 
And okay, it does follow a formulaic pattern, but formulaic is okay if the direction and the casting and the screenplay all hit, you know, all fire on all cylinders. And that's what this movie does. And these teens have so much personality. And do you know how hard it is to make, it's not football or baseball or basketball. This guy is making a movie with chess moves and I'm completely fascinated by the movie. It's like the John Lugazamo character says, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Chess is the great equalizer. And I think critical thinking makes all the right moves to make a corny pun. Next is a movie called The Artist's Wife. Bill, tell us about it. We have a dysfunctional <laughs> couple. This time it's Lena Olin. She's married to Bruce Dern. Uh, she used to paint. He is a painter, uh, or he tries. They live in the Hamptons, uh, and he's got a show coming up, a big show in New York City. One problem, he has dementia. Uh, Lena tries to uh, reunite her husband with an estranged daughter. So there's a subplot going on here. There's an almost unforgivable last scene in this movie. And yet, and yet, and yet, maybe I'll be the lone guy on this one too, but uh, I thought as great a performance as Bruce Dern gives, I've seen him do this angry old guy before. Uh, I haven't seen Lena Olin as the suffering wife, and I thought she was outstanding as the artist's wife. For her performance alone, I recommend this film. Well, I think you are going to be the lone person here, Bill, but let's hear what, uh, maybe not, I don't know. Go ahead, uh, Lisa, what, 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 what's, your, what's your take? Well, this movie was practically exactly made last year. Uh, it was called The Wife, which tells you how, how uncreative both people were. This I mean, if this, if this unprecedented, no, it's not. If this unprecedented moment in history changes anything, I really hope is that we stop having to watch movies that focus solely on the problems of bored, rich, white people. The <laughs> acting is great. Honestly, the acting is great. Like, Bit Bruce Dern is an unbelievable yourself. actor. And I think, on sure, he may campus. have done a variant on this role before, but he does it really well. But the premise of yet another woman who deferred her creative dreams for a spoiled, selfish man, and then we have to walk her through the last stages of her self-disappointment, it just made me want to throw some paint against a wall and pretend it was also a million dollar painting. Justine? I absolutely love that, Lisa. I could not agree more. This definitely evoked elements of the Glenn Close film, The Wife, in that, yes, we're giving voice to the woman beside the tortured artist, but in that way, we still have to watch her suffering for almost two hours. It Thank you. Yes, <laughs> yes. Sorry to interrupt you, but yes. Well, I recently interviewed Lena Olin for The Artist's Wife. Let's take a look at that interview. I'm sure you get a lot of scripts and a lot of stuff. What? was it about this particular script or movie or the director, whatever it is, what made you decide to, to do this project? I think the fact that it was about the wife, the caregiver, the one who stands next to, uh, and her journey that I thought was interesting and, and I could relate to uh, waking up kind of through a tragedy, through when life throws something at you that you kind of wake up and you move forward in such a brilliant way as she does. I think that's what moved me. Did you find yourself, um, if somebody is going off script and improvising, I guess you have to improvise yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how, how was that experience? And is that something you're comfortable with doing? Uh, you know? The answer is no, I'm not comfortable doing it. And for that reason, it's so much fun. If you're in the present in the situation, you just have to roll with it. And whatever is thrown at you, you have to throw it back and react. And I think it's a very authentic way of, of you know, and if the DP and the director, if they're with you, you know, they can catch those authentic moments. Our next movie is a documentary called Class Action Park. It's about Action Park, New Jersey, which was known as the world's most dangerous water park. Its heyday was in the 80s and the extremely unsafe rides, which had no regulations, severely injured countless visitors. The clientele were mainly unruly drunk teenagers who literally risked their lives by going on some of these death trap rides. The owner of the place, known to the staff as Uncle Gene, would come up with these crazy ideas for these dangerous rides on cocktail napkins, and untested, they would build these things with absolutely no safety protocols. The first couple people that came in came out and their mouths were all bloody. And they sent a couple other people down and they came down with lacerations. Well, then they took the loop apart and they found teeth stuck in the padding from the first couple people. Former guests and staff members recollect on what it was like to be there. One former visitor, comedian Chris Gethard, talks about his experiences there as a teen and he's really hilarious. The whole movie is actually really funny most of the way through until the end when people start getting killed and then it becomes deadly serious. Class Action Park, 
for everyone, this doc is one wild ride. Check it out. Lisa. You know, honestly, I hate amusement parks. Big surprise, right? I'm the Grinch who stole amusement parks. But to me, they're forced fun for people who don't have real life risks. And this film did not change my stance, so I found it kind of hell to watch. Really? Uh, Justine? This really freaked me out. It was gruesome. <laughs> it's quintessentially 80s though. It captures the neglect that was going on when it comes to the youth. Whereas now I think there's a bit more of a nurturing attitude, right? Where play playgrounds were so dangerous and so on. And growing up going to water parks, you would hear these urban legends about people dying. And so they were kind of these really scary places to be. Watching this, as you said, by the end, it's a tragedy. And I, I think I was surprised pleasantly by how they handle that part of the story so sensitively. I was really impacted by that. Bill? Well, the sensitivity of this film must have been lost on me. I'll tell you what I enjoyed. It felt to me like a Saturday Night Live sketch. Remember uh, Mameway, the guy that uh, Dan Aykroyd played that sold that glass, uh, like a bag of glass at Christmas? He's like, oh, yeah, kids love it. They love it. That's this, that's this park. I mean, Johnny Knoxville, who's at the beginning of this movie, actually made a funnier version of it that didn't make a lot of money. This yeah, is- Action Point. It was called Action Point. Action Point. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a load more fun. And uh, I, I liked it more than you guys, I guess. It'll be nostalgia for some and eye-opening for others who've never been to the place. My name is Lisa, and I am wife number six of Richard Scott Smith. I started this blog to warn other women that he is a thief, a liar, and most of all, a con man. If you are reading this blog, I am sorry that you have been victimized by Richard Scott Smith. That was a clip from the documentary miniseries Love Fraud. It's Bill McCuddy's personal choice as we go around the panel as we do every month with our Critics Picks of the Month. Bill. Neil, at the McCuddy household, we love reality television like 48 Hours and Dateline, and Love Fraud from Showtime fits perfectly into that. For 20 years, a guy named Richard Scott Smith has been wooing unsuspecting women, marrying them, taking all their money, and then running out of town. He's done this, it turns out, to over a dozen women. This series has him tracked down by the women who all band together, and they're led by a tough-talking, wise-cracking female bounty hunter who I absolutely love and think should have her own series. I highly recommend this. As I said, only four hours, you're gonna love it. Oh, get Lisa. I wasn't that intrigued by the concept of it, and then I saw that the directors of the series were Heidi Ewan and Rachel Grady, who are both brilliant documentarians. Hello, Jesus Camp. And honestly, this is so good. I mean, and I absolutely agree with you that the female oh. bounty hunter needs her own, she needs her own universe, actually. <laughs> Justine? I echo both of you on that. She was an absolute riot to watch. And for all the seriousness of this story, watching these survivors reclaim their power, kind of similar to the Dirty John story, and have no choice but to become amateur sleuths was actually quite endearing. Yeah, and in the last episode, they have an interview with Smith himself, which is just, I mean, this guy has like this unconscionable liar, which is just fascinating to watch. And, um, you know, it's also an interesting and disturbing look at our legal system, how they don't prioritize this kind of stuff. And I was just completely captivated by this, as, as you said, Bill. It's only four episodes. It's on Showtime. Check it out. Okay, next critics pick. Uh, what do you got for us, Justine? Uh, a most excellent one, Neil. <laughs> I had to. After waiting almost 30 years, we've finally gotten the third installment of the Bill and Ted series. Bill and Ted Face the Music. Of course, this stars Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves, and it's the feel-good movie we need right now. They're tasked with writing one song to save humanity as we know it. If only that were true. Now their dads, and this time their daughters, are the ones helping them save the world. It's a fun throwback, it's goofy, and it's the perfect dose of escapism. Lisa? Well, I mean, let's be clear. Keanu, I think, is the best cure that I know for pandemic despair, aesthetically, emotionally, morally, and he doesn't disappoint here. And also, I gotta say, small but important note, I really dig that the wives are age appropriate. It never happens. Bill? Uh, listen, I hate to be the naysayer here because- No, it, you don't. It took 10 years for this script to come together. I, I loved the first one so much that it was painful kind of for me to revisit this. So if you're not that familiar with the first one, this is kind of a fun ride, but I think, you know, we're missing obviously George Carlin, who's not with us anymore, and a couple of other elements that I think were more interesting in the first one. But, uh, you know, I have to say, maybe I'm too invested in it, so I should take a pass on this one. 
No, they're likable and it's ridiculous, but that's the point of it. And it's fun. And, and, and Reeves and Winter are, seem to be having such a great time that I think that their, their fun is kind of infectious and you get caught up in the whole thing. Plus, I like the cameos by, you know, they have an actor playing Mozart, one playing Louis Armstrong, one playing Jimi Hendrix. I think it's the opposite of what you're saying, Bill. I think if they, you're a fan of the series, if you're not a fan of the series, I'd say skip it. But if you are a fan, you're going to go, whoa, excellent. So uh, I couldn't resist either, Justine. All right, Lisa, what's your critics pick? Uh, it is, I'm thinking of ending things. What a, what a fun title, guys. Uh, this is the latest film from Charlie Kaufman, who, like Miranda July, actually, has a unique brand of eclectic and existentialist surrealism. Uh, this one stars the firecracker up-and-comer Jessie Buckley as the least firecracker she's ever been on a visit with her new boyfriend, Jesse Clemens. I love him in everything, by the way. Uh, to meet his parents, Tony Collette and David Thewlis. Obviously, it being a Kaufman movie, it's not as simple as all that. And as time and truth and memory and perception start to warp, I mean, literally, there's times where Tony Collette and David seem like they're 80,000 years old, and other times they seem like they're 20. Um, but as that goes on, you would be forgiven if you start to feel like you're reading a Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut novel that's written in Russian while it, on a hallucinogen. So let's be clear, it is not for everyone, but I like how it sort of takes male projection and male hubris and it turns it on its head with a tenderness that honestly seems appropriate for this moment in time. Listen, um, I, 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 all right, Phil, <laughs> you're, you're holding up a sign, so, so, so go ahead. <laughs> I said, Lisa, listen to me, it's a blood, sweat and tears line. Look, uh, I, I maybe need to step out of this and not even be a, a judge because uh, I thought it was time to get out of this thing. I gave this thing up at 19 minutes and 18 and seconds. You should probably stop talking. That's literally the worst thing a critic can do is not even bother to talk about a movie, but still think they have the right to opine on the film. Like, let's just move on. Bill, you're fired. You're fired. I mean, off the ledge, I said I would accuse myself, but I want to warn people. I want to accuse myself, but? I think this thing is a complete mess. Uh, what I saw of it, sorry. Yeah, seriously, you're moot. The question is moot. Uh, Justine. I have to say, <laughs> I actually, re I did the opposite of you, Bill. I actually gave it a second chance and I rewatched it last night and I actually enjoyed it quite a bit more because I wasn't as on edge and I understood it differently. And I think this is a director where you have to sometimes work for it. I know that not everybody wants to do that. This is a very finite audience. It's certainly a mind bender. I love going back through and there's actually little clues and hidden, hidden meetings that you can find. Okay, listen, I'm a big fan of Charlie Kaufman. As a screenwriter, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, one of my favorite films. I liked Adaptation being John Malkovich. But as a writer director, uh, I don't really, you know, I think that he needs to be reined in. I mean, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Cynic Dosh, which was another, that a film that he wrote and directed, did not like this. And it, this is existential, unanswered questions, which I think that that's the point of this, is there's supposed to be a lot of unanswered questions. But I did not gravitate to, to this at all, and I did not dig this film. It was a confusing exercise for me. I would skip it, apparently. Okay, moving on. Apparently, Lisa and Justine have different, feel differently. Finally, my pick is Mulan. Now, I'm not usually a fan of Disney's live action remakes of their animated classics. I'm always, always disappointed, but not this time. In fact, this is the first one where it's actually better than the original. The star is director Nikki Caro eliminated the song because she also got rid of that comedic side trick, Dragon Mushu. And what we have now instead in the new version is a serious, mature, dramatic, big budget epic, and it's a welcome change. It's about a young Chinese maiden, maiden who disguises herself as a male warrior in order to save her father. Yifei Leo is sensational in the title role as she masters the exciting martial arts fight scenes and empowers women all along the way. Jet Li's briefly on hand as the Chinese emperor. Overall, it's well executed with breathtaking cinematography, opulent sets, elaborate period costumes, and thrilling action scenes. I can't believe this is a Disney movie, actually. Uh, Lisa, what do you think? What a hot mess this movie is. Aside from the controversy of Disney working with regions of China that have put thousands of Muslims in internment camps, you didn't mention that part. I mean, I feel like it upholds the Disney tradition of stripping all the fun and awe in the translation from the animated version of the film to the live action. It's like the worst of American determinism and that sort of fake you go girl feminism and a weird Disney translation of Chinese culture. I was in awe that you liked it so much. Oh. Please, Justine? Well, it is, I do think it is a visual marvel and the production design I felt was stellar. The colors really pop and I, I do think the performances were really strong. 
but yes, of course, there's a controversy that can't be ignored. And the fact that overall, it does feel like it's all being explored through a Western lens. Bill? Oh, I'm almost afraid to say I like this movie, but- uh, I like the movie. Don't be afraid to say it. I like the movie. Uh, I was glad it didn't have songs in it. Uh, I, it moved for me. I thought it worked well for young and old adults. Disney's not telling us yet how much money they made on it on Disney Plus. Instead of, as we didn't mention, it didn't get into movie theaters, or it is in a few. Uh, I think this is um, a well-told story. I knew the story going in. I thought all the acting was great. Uh, I didn't even recognize Jet Li as the emperor. Uh, and I was only disappointed by a climactic fight scene at the very end that seemed to be over in like 30 seconds. Uh, I expected more there. Other than that, I can recommend this film uh, no matter what the controversy, because I didn't know about it or care about it. I'm Hua Mulan. I will bring honor to us all. So we're split on this, and that's about all the time we have. With any luck, we've given you some movies and TV shows to watch to help pass the time. I want to thank Lisa Rossman. It was lovely to see you, kids. Bill McCuddy. Neil, you're the best. Everyone agrees. No nope. <laughs> and, and Justine Browning. I'm nodding when you'll talk to them. Oh, bang. <laughs> Stay well, everybody. I'm Neil Rosen. Join us next time on Talking Pictures. <laughs>